Hello, AP Bio. Welcome to our video lecture for Chapter 12, The Chromosomal Basis of Inheritance. So as is our tradition, we're going to begin with a picture. So this is, this is Jack again. This is a couple years ago. Um, this is clearly Halloween. Um, he is dressed as Woody from Toy Story. So the reason why I picked this picture um, is actually not about, about Woody. It's about Buzz. And this my, my reasoning here gets a little meta. So just, just bear with me here. So you can see that cut of Buzz in the background. Um, clearly, you can tell that's Buzz, right? But it's, it's not quite right, right? The colors are wrong. Um, the face isn't quite right. You know, he's not yellow and green in the cartoon. It's sort of like a, I mean, it's clearly a knockoff, right? It's sort of like a different flavor of Buzz. Well, this, this chapter is also on genetics problems, like the chapter 11 was, but there's sort of different flavors. Um, namely, we're going to do problems that involve sex-linked genes, which means they're located on the X chromosome or linked genes, which means they're located on the same chromosome. So you're gonna recognize these, like you recognize Buzz, we're still gonna do punished squares and such, but there's some, there's some extra um, details, some extra refinements, because these are, these are sort of exceptions. It's not that Mendel was wrong, it's that there are, there are scenarios where it's not quite as simple as he described it. So what this chapter seeks to do is it tries to take Mendel's conclusions and connect them to what chromosomes actually do, the chromosome, chromosomes' behaviors. Um, we've already seen that the word gene, you know, Mendel called them her, uh, hereditary factors, we just use the word genes, and the genes you know, are located on specific chromosomes in specific places. You can actually tag genes with fluorescent dyes, this is a picture of that, the little yellow glowing dots, um, to locate where genes actually are on what chromosomes. Um, you know, this slide, you know, we talked about this when we did chapter 11. So Mendel's conclusions of segregation and, and independent assortment, and actually we kind of already said this when we did chapter 11. So we can, we can define where those happen in meiosis, which was described in the late um, 19th century, Mendel didn't know about it, um, as to why those happen. So remember we said in the previous chapter that the law of segregation, if I asked you when that happened, that would be um, anaphase one of meiosis, and that the law of independent assortment, how what one gene does doesn't affect how other genes are inherited, unless they're linked, um, happens during metaphase one of meiosis. Um, you need to understand where Mendel's conclusions fit on chromosomes behavior in meiosis. Um, this is a complex diagram, but this, this should make sense to you. So we need to get into probably the, maybe the second most famous father of genetics. Um, this guy came about 50 years after Mendel. This is a guy named Thomas Morgan. Um, Thomas Morgan experimented with fruit flies. I believe he actually got the, the Nobel Prize. Um, fruit flies are a great animal to experiment with because one, they're animals. So if you want to do animal genetics, you know, you need animals, you, plants won't work. They produce many offspring. You can get new generations in about 14 days. Um, um, they, again, they, they, they reproduce rapidly. There's also only four pairs of chromosomes. There's eight chromosomes. So finding where the genes are is much simpler than it would be with, with humans. Um, one new term that we haven't used before, the term wild type. This is really important. You know what this term means. Wild type is what you call the phenotype that most occurs in nature, as in the normal. And I hate using the word normal because that's it's kind of a loaded term. But in nature, fruit flies have red eyes. Okay, so the wild type trait for fruit for fruit fly eyes is red. All right. Um, I don't know if the wild type is always dominant, but in, in, in our case, it's, it's going to be dominant. All right. Now, Morgan, this, this is actually a fascinating story because he, he crossed fruit flies for many, many years. He counted thousands of fruit flies. And one day in his lab, he walks in and he finds a fruit fly that had white eyes. All right, that's a mutant type. Um, it was a random mutation in one of his flies and it had white eyes. And what's interesting is, you know, if that hadn't happened, we wouldn't be talking about this or maybe somebody else would have known it. Um, it's serendipity, right? And actually, you can, you, know, you can order fruit flies to do studies with. You can order white-eyed fruit flies in the mail, like to schools and universities. And all those flies are descendants of that one fly that Thomas Morgan encountered you know, over 100 years ago. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, so here's what he, he, what he found. So he was doing similar crosses to what Mendel was doing. When he would cross um, 
white eyed males, okay, so a male with white eyes, with red eyed females, which is the wild type. In the F1s, all the flies had red eyes. So, so far, this is just like Mendel found with pea plants. Cross a purple plant and a white plant, and the F1s, they're all purple. Then he would cross two F1 flies to get the F2 generation, and guess what? He got the classical three to one ratio, just like Mendel got but with one, one extra uh, complication. All of the flies that had white eyes were male. There were no females with white eyes. So he's like, oh gosh, well something, something's going on. Um, something's more complicated than, than Mendel found. And what he concludes is that the gene for eye color, of course is related to the gender of the fly, but specifically because it's on the X chromosome. All right, remember when we did karyotypes back in chapter um, 10, I believe? And we saw that you know, the X chromosome was a pretty long chromosome. The Y chromosome was a pretty short chromosome. There are many genes on the X chromosome. Um, color blindness, hemophilia, obviously genes that, that regulate gender. Um, but genes aside from, from sex, there are genes on the X chromosome, like in this case, the fly color, okay? Um, your textbook uses this diagram. I don't love this diagram. I'm gonna show you a different one that I drew in a minute. But this is just showing um, you know, it's worth seeing their notation. So the W with a plus stands for the wild type, and just the W stands for the mutant type. If this were the AP exam and they gave you one like this in the little intro to the question, they would tell you what, what the symbols stand for if they're using something, you know, that's not, not the norm. Um, I don't like using the W plus and, the, and the, just the plain W. I want to use something else. But if you see one like this, and of course, obviously, you know, this sign stands for female and that sign stands for male, that, that you should also know. Um, okay, so sex-linked genes, like I said, they're genes usually on the X chromosome. On the Y chromosome, it's just worth pointing out, there's a gene called the SRY gene, and that's a gene that is responsible for the development of testes and a growing fetus. And basically, um, when a fetus first forms, it's undifferentiated, as they can become either gender. And if you have a Y chromosome, the SRY gene basically causes the fetus to produce testicles, which will produce testosterone, which turns the fetus into a, a boy. If you don't have the Y chromosome, it turns into a girl. Okay? I mean, and look at the relative size. Look how big the X is and how small the Y is. The Y doesn't do a whole lot, um, really, aside from turning a developing fetus into a boy. Okay, so sex-linked genes, like I said, they can be on either chromosome, but usually they're on the X chromosome because that's more common. This term, hemizygous, so boys only have one X chromosome. So Mendel's whole rule of, you know, you have two copies of each gene, that doesn't apply here if you're a boy because you only have one X, you only have one copy of the gene. Color blindness, hemophilia, we're going to go through examples of these when I see you in class. But this is a, a bit of an exception because we have to consider does the individual, is it a boy or girl, have one X or two Xs? So I want to go through, so th this is my, my chicken scratch going through Mendel, or not Mendel, Thomas Morgan's fruit fly data as to if this were a question, how would you work it out? So I did this in my handwriting so you could see how I worked it out. So here we're crossing a red-eyed female and a white-eyed male, okay, just like Thomas Morgan did. My notation, I'm going to use a plus sign to be the wild type which is red, which th this isn't mine. This is a, a very common way of doing it. And a minus sign is the mutant type, which is white, all right? Again, the wild type just means what happens in nature, like what's what's normal one. Um, red eye female, so notice when, when I do the parents genotypes, I have to have um, the plus or minus, and I have to have XX or XY, because it's sex linked. So this is a girl, XX. Um, She's a normal XX. Now she could be X plus X minus and have red eyes. I realized that this fly was true breeding because there were no whites before. Uh, Mendel got the, the first white eyed fly, at least not in laboratories. So in this case, I, I know it's X plus X plus. A white eyed male, well, it's X minus Y. Notice the Y doesn't have a plus or minus because it doesn't have the gene. So the only way to be a white eyed male is to be X minus Y, okay? Here I put um, the female on top of the Punnett square, the male on the side, and I, I cross it. So this is a red-eyed female, red-eyed female, red-eyed male, red-eyed male. Um, they're all red eyes, right? So this is what Thomas Morgan got. He got F1s, they were all red eyes, all right? Now, now what I wanna do is I wanna take 
two F1s and cross them. Now, this will only give you good data if all the males are the same and all the females are the same. The two ways of being female, that's a female and that's a female, they're the same, right? And the two ways of being male, that's a male, that's a male, they're the same too. So like if this was X plus X plus, and this was X plus X minus, they're both red-eyed females, but if you don't know the genotype specifically, you know, you don't know, you don't know which, if, if the, if the red-eyed female was, was homozygous or heterozygous. In this case, you do, because that's the only way to be female. That's the only way to be male, right? So when I cross to get the F2s, I'm going to cross this female or that one. They would be the same with one of these males. Does that make sense? I, I hope it does. So what I just said, now I'm going to cross two F1 flies, and I know that's a female from this Punnett square. That's a male from this Punnett square. Um, and when you cross them, so I put the female here, put the male there. Look what happens. This is a um, red-eyed female, red-eyed female. They're both red-eyed females, but, you know, they're different. So in this case, if I cross the F2s to get F3s, you wouldn't know the genotype of which female it was right? You can't look at a female and tell her genotype. It's just red eyes. This is a red-eyed male, and this is a white-eyed male. So three to one ratio, red to white, but all the white-eyed flies are male, which is this box right there, all right? Um, again, we're going to go through examples of sex length problems in class, um, so we'll, we'll revisit this later. This is the textbook's illustration of that. Um, I kind of like mine better, so I, that's why I drew my own, but it's, it's using, here they're using big N and little N. Big N would be normal, which would be red eyes. Little N would be the mutant type, which would be white eyes. You know, terrific. Okay, so some other complications. So girls don't need two X chromosomes. You know, guys only have one and they do just fine. I guess that's debatable, but they, they live and survive just fine. So having two X chromosomes is actually being kind of wasteful. So oftentimes cells will inactivate one of the X chromosomes. It just condenses into a very tight, small little ball. It's like turning off, turning off the chromosome and it's called a bar body. Um, the best example of this is a calico cat. So calico cats have you know, the kind of splotchy coloration. And the reason is because the gene for their fur colors on the X chromosome, of you know, there are no male calico cats. If you didn't realize this, all calico cats are female. Um, if the female is heterozygous and you deactivate one of the X chromosomes, it's like she's hemizygous because you turned it off. And, you know, where you turned it on or off depends upon where the cell was located. Because if it's turned off in one cell and it goes to mitosis and the two cells you produce, it's the same version that's turned off. So, like, it's splotchy based upon location, right? Um, here I inactivated the sort of orange color, and here I inactivated the, the darker color, and based upon you know what cell it originated from gives you the splotchiness. So calico cats show bar bodies. There are other examples, but that's the one the AP exam always uses, so we'll, we'll stick with that. As long as you know one, you're fine. So linked genes. Okay, Thomas Morgan wasn't done, all right? He, he did more. Um, linked genes is where kids get a little bit confused, and we're gonna go through some diagrams but at the end, the, the concept, you know, how the numbers of these, how the math fits the concept is what you need to know. So just, just bear with me here. So linked genes means they're on the same chromosome. So notice here, the gene for B and the gene for VG, we'll see what those are in a minute, they're literally on the same chromosome. So, you know, when chromosomes do segregation, like one chromosome goes that way and one chromosome goes that way, if the genes are on the same chromosome, they can't segregate because they're, they're literally linked. They're attached to one another. Um, they can't independently assort. Now, you could have crossing over. I, I can have a crossing over, over event here, which separates the different alleles. So actually, they can separate if they're very far apart from the same chromosome, which that's going to be an important thing we see uh, in just a minute. Um, but if you're linked, you don't independently assort. This is the same picture, just bigger. So in class, we're going to go through an example of this. This particular diagram I find to be overwhelming because like this is a lot of information. Um, 
I want us to look at this really to look at the numbers down here, okay? I don't want you to get hung up on the Punnett square because I don't think the AP exam would have you do a Punnett square like this, all right? So just, just bear with me here. So we're gonna do a dihybrid cross between a fly that has a gray body in normal wings, and those are dominant, those are the wild type, gray body, normal wings, with a fly that has a black body and vestigial wings. Vestigial wings are, see how they're kind of like shriveled? It's, it's a mutation, it's recessive, the fly can't really fly. Um, so this is like double dominant and this is double recessive, okay? Um, so one, one parent is gray and normal, one parent is black and vestigial, all right? Um, if I do the cross, again, don't worry about the planet square, just look at the results, all right? I get, here are my choices. It's not a four by four box because you don't need to do a four by four box. Don't worry about why. We'll do more of this later. So I can get a fly that is gray and normal, black and vestigial, gray and vestigial, or black and normal. All right. So how many choices are there? There are four different choices. What's the likelihood of each choice? 25%. Right? It's a one to one to one to one ratio. Okay. Again, don't worry, don't worry about making the Punnett square, just worry about interpreting the Punnett square, all right? The AP exam is more likely to give you a Punnett square to interpret like this than they are to have you actually draw it. So, okay, cool. Um, so, one of the parents was gray and normal, right? This offspring is gray and normal, right? That's called a parental type, right? This parent, the, the original parent, was um, black and vestigial. This fly is black and vestigial, right? This is called a parental type because it's like what the original parents were. This fly is gray and vestigial, all right? There, there weren't gray vestigial flies, right? This is a new combination of the genes, as is black and normal. These two are called recombinant types because they're not types like the parents. Here you've reshuffled the genes. So parental type, parental type, recombinant type, recombinant type. Let me give you an example. You have a dad, uh, black hair and brown eyes. You have a mom, um, red hair and blue eyes. If they have a kid with black hair and brown eyes, that's a parental type. If they have a kid, with black hair and blue eyes, that's a recombinant type because you took the blue eyes from the mom and the black hair from the dad, okay? Now, statistics should tell me I should get a one to one to one to one ratio, all right? And I, I need that bar to go away. Look at the actual numbers. I'm looking at the very bottom where it says results. 965, 944, 206, and 185. That is not a one to one to one to one ratio, right? I have way more I have way more parental types than I do recombinant types, right? Like if I add up, I think it adds up to 2,000 flies. Maybe it, it rounds to 2,000. Let's go with 2,000. I have way more parental types, these two, than I do recomb recombinant types. Actually, the ratio is one to one to zero to zero, okay? So something is going on, all right? My hypothesis is one to one to one to one. I get one to one to zero to zero, all right? So maybe it's sex linked. Could, could those results come from it being sex linked? Sure it could. Does this slide like tell me like there's more male gray vestigial or more female black normals? No, my data here doesn't give me gender data, right? There's no gender data here. So is this sex linked? The question, I mean, doesn't tell me the gender of the offspring, so I don't know, but it's not, all right? This kind of data means the two genes are on the same chromosome. This is where the numbers need to fit the concept. If you have more parental types than recombinant types, which you do, it means the genes are on the same chromosome, which means they are linked, all right? Um, that is the concept you need to get. Um, this slide just shows the, the vocabulary, parental types, recombinant types. We have already done this. 
if the genes are on different chromosomes, it should be 50-50 parental types or recombinant types, right? Um, this is just an, another example using peas. These are parental types, these are recombinant types. If they're on different chromosomes, it should be 50-50 which one you get, or in this case, 25, 25, 25, 25, right? Um, if they're linked, you're gonna get more parental types than recombinant types. Um, now again, crossing over messes with it. So maybe you do get some recombinant, you know, heck, look, I did get some recombinant types. Well, how is that possible if the genes are linked? Because crossing over can unlink them, right? This is the book's explanation of that. Um, we don't need to go through all, I don't wanna go through all this. I do wanna point out one thing at the bottom. Um, and we're gonna do this math in class. If a question asks for the recombination frequency, look at the very bottom of the slide. All I do is I, the top of that fraction where it says 391, I add up how many recombinant types there were. 206 and 185 adds up to 391. By the, to the number of flies total, it wasn't 2,000, it was 2,300. Look at that right behind me, stupid bar. See where it says 2,300? Um, divide those in times by 100, right? So if, if there's 100 total flies and 21 of them are recombinant types, you do 21 over 100 is 21 percent. All right, we're going to do ones like that in class. I just wanted to uh, to introduce how to get recombination frequency on the video. This is just the same diagram bigger. All right, see number of recombinants over total times 100 is the recombination frequency. If this was 50 percent, the genes are on di different chromosomes. So a linkage map. This is uh, useful. So. Say the genes are on the same chromosome, but they cross over a lot, that means they're really far apart. Do you get that if, if, if genes are really close together, the chance of them crossing over is very small because they're so close together. If the genes are far apart, the chance of them crossing over is greater because they're further apart. There's more of a chance of the chromosomes overlapping, right? So a linkage map is just a map of where the genes are. Um, it's not a cytological map, like it's not, doesn't necessarily show you where it is exactly, it just shows you how far away it is from other genes. So like, and again, we're gonna do these in class, but a 1% recombination frequency is one map unit. So the previous slide uh, had a 17% recombination frequency, so those two genes are 17 map units apart. And notice I have the B, the CN, and the VG. B and the CN is 9%. C and VG is 9.5%, those, those add up more or less to 17. We're gonna you know, do some fuzzy math there. Um, that's how you get linkage maps. You take the recombination frequency and try and map it out. Like if, if these two cross over three times, or I'm sorry, if these two have a percent combination of 3% and these have 7%, then these have 10%. We're gonna do these in class, so we'll come back to that later. Um, a cytogenetic map you know, ac actually gives you like where the where the where the genes actually are, um, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so the the end of this chapter is simple. So large scale chromosomal alterations in humans are usually fatal. Um, if you're missing a chromosome, usually, or you have a translocation or an inversion, usually that fetus would would miscarry. Um, and actually, most miscarriages are due to genetic abnormalities in the fetus. So. Plants tolerate genetic changes much more than animals do. Plants can handle extra sets of chromosomes. Animals cannot, all right, usually. So the term non-disjunction, this is just a fancy word for, um, like, look at the picture. This cell went through meiosis, and this homologous pair didn't separate, right? And follow it through, I end up with egg or sperm that either have one too many chromosomes or one too few right? Here, they didn't separate in meiosis two, and these two, this one's got one too many, this one's got one too few, these two are fine. So non-disjunction is when homologous chromosomes don't separate properly, and you wind up with gametes that have the wrong chromosome number. In humans, the gametes should have 23 chromosomes, right? So that would have 24, 24, 22, 22, 24, 22, 23, 23. Um, and if those egg or sperm go on to fertilize to form a baby, um, like that could be Down syndrome. Um, but usually, like if I have an extra chromosome number five, usually that baby would, would, 
miscarrying. Okay. Um, you need to note that non-disjunction like is when chromosomes don't separate properly. And this is meiosis, not mitosis, because this, this involves um, gametes, not normal cells. Same diagram. Um, these are just some fancy words. So aneuploidy is just what you call it um, when you get gametes when non-disjunction happened. Um, a monosomic zygote has one too few chromosomes. So for humans, it would be a zygote that has 45 chromosomes, which is two n minus one. Uh, trisomic is when you have an extra one. So for humans, it would be having 47, like Down syndrome, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, two n plus one. Polyploidy is having, you know, well, your cells are diploid, so that's normal. Triploid would be three n. Tetraploid would be four n. Animals can't handle that. That zygote would die. Um, plants can, you know, Plants can handle triploid and tetraploid. Some of the, the, the wheat that you eat in your sandwich is, I forget if it's a triploid or a tetraploid, but it's, it's got multiple, more than two sets of chromosomes. Um, okay, this is super easy. So abnormal chromosome structure. So a deletion is when you delete a piece of a chromosome. So here I deleted gene D, all right? A duplication is when I duplicate a segment. So here I duplicated BC. That bar really gets on my nerves. Um, that's a duplication, right? Hopefully this is like super easy. An inversion is just when you take a segment and you switch it backwards. How this happens, we'll see in a later chapter, the BCD went backwards. A translocation, uh-oh, I can't see this. Let's do, there we go, that makes it better. A translocation is when two pieces of chromosome switch places, or actually it can just be one piece that moves to the wrong chromosome. So this chromosome, the A and the B went to that chromosome, and the M and O went to that chromosome. This is interesting because all the, all the DNA is still there. It's just in the wrong place. Actually, in this one, the DNA is still there. You didn't lose or add any genes. It's just, it's in the wrong place. In this case, it's backwards, and that, that's bad. Like, you can have all the genes there and have them in the wrong place, and that's still bad. Why that's bad, we're going to see in a later chapter. I say a lot of that, don't I? I promise we'll get to it. Um, some human diseases. Um, let's just go through some, some examples. The AP exam would give you the background that you needed to answer these questions. Down syndrome is having three copies of chromosome number 21. Normally, having three copies of a chromosome is fatal, um, would be a miscarriage. Chromosome 23, having three copies of it doesn't result in death. Uh, people with Down syndrome can live decades. They can live into you know, their 40s or 50s or even longer. Um, there's heart issues, there's mental issues, obviously there's some, some facial issues, some speech issues, but you can, you can survive fine. Um, Kleinfelter is what you call it if you have an extra sex chromosome, if you're XXY. Um, this would be a result of non-disjunction, non right? If you're XXY, you're a boy because you have a Y, and you might not even know that you have Kleinfelters. The symptoms are... Okay, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember. I think you're taller than normal. I think maybe you're, you're slender than normal. You might have a slightly smaller, like your head might be more narrow, I believe, but people, would, people might have it not even know they have it. Um, there might be some fertility issues where you might have a hard time conceiving a child. Trisomy X is having is XXX, having triple X. Um, obviously, you're a girl. Um, they're taller than normal, but you can have it not even know it. Um, monosomy X is also called Turner syndrome. This is, it's the, the nickname is XO. You only have one sex chromosome, which it's, you just have an X. The O just means you're missing the other one. Um, so you're a girl, right? Because you, you know, you have the X. Um, you're, you're fine. You survive fine. Oftentimes you're sterile, as in you can't conceive. Um, but you know, health-wise you're, you're okay. And actually that's the only viable monosomy where you know, the only chromosome that you can be missing one is if you are exo. Um, Credit syndrome, that's a French term, means cry of the cat. This is a disease, it's a specific deletion in chromosome five. And I used to have a picture, I don't think I have that anymore. Um, kids that are born with this, um, it's, it's, the name comes from the fact that, if, if, in class, remind me, and I'll pull up a video of this, Kids that cry that have this, their cry sounds like a cat in the alley. Like it's eerie how much it sounds like a cat. Um, they die in infancy or early childhood. They have mental issues. I mean, it's a developmental problem. They're, they're not going to survive. 
Philadelphia syndrome is a translocation between chromosomes 9 and 22. So like here, this piece of chromosome 22 is broken off and it's stuck to chromosome 9. This can result in different kinds of cancer, specifically leukemia, I believe. And again, this is interesting because all the genes are there, but they're in the wrong place, which means they're expressed incorrectly, which we'll get to when we do gene expression. Okay, so hope that was helpful. Uh, that's enough for one video. I will see you guys next time. Bye.